Twitter has sued Musk for refusing to complete the merger agreement in the Delaware Chancery Court. Let's look at the options for possible outcomes. Will he have to complete the purchase? Can the court order him to do that? Can he just walk away for a billion dollars? That's been reported all over the media and social media. Can he just walk away without having to pay anything? To find the answers, we'll look at the lawsuit. But first, let's take a look at this $1 billion argument. Hey guys, Musk can just walk away from this agreement. All he has to do is pay a termination fee and he can just leave for a billion dollars. That's completely incorrect. Anybody saying that has not read the agreement. The $1 billion termination fee is available to the parties only in a couple of circumstances. First, if the company uh, terminates pursuant to the fact, say it got a, a better offer from another company as defined in the agreement, it can terminate the agreement and pay Musk a billion dollars. There's a couple of um, scenarios where the company can terminate the agreement and pay Musk a billion dollars. Musk can only terminate the agreement under one provision, and that is terminated by a parent, that's Musk in this case, uh, under clause section 8.1.D.2, which has to do with the board making an adverse recommendation. That's not the case here, but that's the only clause under the termination fee section of the agreement that allows Musk to terminate the agreement and pay the termination fee. That's it. doesn't have anything to do with bots or he's mad about this or they're mad about that. That's the only time he can terminate the agreement himself and get the and pay the termination fee to be res resolved and absolved of any other liability. So he cannot pay $1 billion and just walk away. That one's out of the equation. So he's going to either face some serious damages or specific performance, i.e. has to complete the agreement, or he can walk away with nothing. We'll look at what those two options are now. So one option is Musk is right and he has the ability to terminate this agreement and walk away from it due to material breach by Twitter. In that case, of course, he doesn't have to pay them damages and he wouldn't have to proceed with the agreement. The other case is he's wrong. Twitter has not materially breached this agreement and he's just trying to get out of it. In that case, in a normal case, you would have money damages. Hey, you said you'd buy this company for this much money. Now the stock's only worth this much. Pay me the difference. But this contract is a little different in that it has a specific performance clause in it. And this means the court can order the parties to take the actions necessary to complete the agreement. In other words, it could force Twitter hypothetically to turn the shares over to Musk if he were ready to tender the money. And on the other side, they can order Musk to turn over the money and take the shares. It seems maybe a little bizarre uh, to the casual observer because that's not the typical court remedy, but it is one. It is one available in the Chancery Court, and it is one that Musk agreed to in the merger agreement with Twitter. He said, yes, we, I agree, we will do this. The court will have jurisdiction to order this if it's appropriate. Specific performance. So he's facing, I don't have to pay anything, all the way up to, I may be ordered by the court to actually tender the entire amount of money necessary, along with the other conditions of the closing, to effectuate this purchase. So this is high stakes poker. Twitter shows in its complaint that Musk gave them three reasons why he was backing out of the deal. The first is that Twitter did not information share and cooperate as it was required to do under the contract. Second, that they made materially inaccurate representations incorporated by reference into the merger agreement that are reasonably likely to result in a company material adverse effect and that they failed to comply with the ordinary course covenant because they terminated some high level employees and they also put a hiring freeze on, etc. One of those three for Musk needs to stick. We'll look at each one in turn. Under the agreement, Musk has the right on reasonable notice to have information provided to him by Twitter in a way that's not disruptive to the operations of the business during normal business hours on reasonable notice. He can get information concerning the business properties and personnel of the company as may be reasonably requested in writing for a reasonable business purpose related to the consummation of the transaction. He doesn't have the right to get that information, obviously, if it's notice and scope is unreasonable. Also, if it can cause significant competitive harm to the company, if the transactions contemplated by this agreement are not consummated. He also has the ability to seek some information from the company related to the financial matters that can be relevant to completing the purchase. So the big deal is Musk says Twitter refused to cooperate. They frustrated our attempts to gain information that we needed to con uh, consummate the transaction. They didn't do it. Um, so 
that gives us the ability to back out of the agreement. In large part, this is related to gathering information about uh, bots, but also just Twitter traffic in general, etc. It's certainly the case that Twitter provided a lot of information to Musk. Twitter makes the case in its lawsuit that Musk representatives amped up their request for information and increased the scope of it and reduced the deadlines. And they did these things after Musk had made plain that he did not want to go forward with this purchase anymore. So in other words, the continuing requests for information were a pretext. Twitter has a pretty good argument too that you don't need these things to finish the transaction, okay? You, you, you have the loan commitments, you have the money, you may be interested in these things, but they're nothing you have to know right now in order to finish this transaction. You, you already know what Twitter is, you know what it does, you know its basic financial statements. This stuff became a fishing expedition as an excuse for you later to back out of the agreement. Really, I find that argument pretty persuasive. Um, he said he wanted to do this deal quickly. They set an aggressive time frame. He did not uh, engage in ordinary due diligence where you would look through these sorts of things. That was not part of his process. He went ahead with a full merger agreement instead of a letter of intent. So I think Twitter's got the better side of this. Let's look at the second argument. The second argument Musk has is that Twitter made materially false statements in its agreement disclosures, in other words, to the SEC, which were incorporated by reference, specifically on this bot issue and whether the bots were less than 5% of the average daily users or however it was defined. This, to the degree Musk has a strong argument to breach, this would be it because he's saying, here's a specific thing that you promised to us that I know is not true. and it was false and that's material and so I can leave the agreement. So let's talk about what the contract says about that. First, it does put this obligation on Twitter to not make material misrepresentations in the filings it had to the SEC. They were incorporated by reference. However, it limits that obligation by saying those misrepresentations must rise to, to the level of something that could likely cause a company material adverse event. So there's two things there. First, was it false? Okay, Musk needs to show that. And then secondly, he also needs to show that it could cause an adverse event to the company. In other words, cause really bad thing to happen to the company if this falsehood were found out. So let's look at the first step. And that is, was there a material false statement or not? Well, nobody knows. I mean, everybody has different experiences on Twitter. Are there more than 5% bots or not? I would think certainly there probably are. Musk certainly seemed to think that before he was buying the company because he kept talking about how he was going to fight this bot problem. So even if Twitter did say something else in its SEC filings, can you really claim you're surprised by that? I mean, you're the guy who said, I, I'm buying this to get rid of bots, bro, and censorship, but the bots are a big issue. I'll fight them to the death. I, I don't know. I don't have any idea what the overall stats are, but I will say that Twitter is not completely stupid. It hires smart people to make these filings. And they didn't just say to the SEC, we swear on a holy document of, of whatever type that we choose, that there are less than 5% bots on this site at any time. That is, that is not what they said. As a matter of fact, Twitter notes in its lawsuit that they said that their calculation may differ from estimates published by third parties or competitors, may not accurately reflect the actual number of people or organizations using our platform. As for the estimate of spam or false accounts as a percentage, Twitter says this is based on an internal review of a sample accounts involves significant judgment and may not accurately represent the actual number of false or spam accounts. It could be too low. So with those kind of qualifications in place, can you say the fact that you suspect that there are more than 5% bots means that they lied there. They said this is based on the methodology we, we use. It could be wrong, okay? So don't rely on it too tightly um, for, for what we're saying here. We're not promising that there's 5% bots or whatever. So I think Musk has a big problem to make this argument stick because of the qualifications of the SEC documents, his own position before the agreement was signed, and the usual inclination of the Delaware Chancery Court to move agreements forward on the basis that the parties were sophisticated and entered into these contracts with, with a chance to gain knowledge on each side, which certainly was the case here. Musk was the one rushing the agreement, not Twitter. So I, I think he's got a problem here even making the first element of this. Secondly, uh, could it cause a material adverse event? That one is a little grayer, I suppose. Obviously, if 
the converse were true of what Twitter was saying, that 95% of the users were fake and 5% were real, and that suddenly got out, it's hard to believe that their market value would not suffer from that disclosure. So I don't think you can say that that there's no potential materiality in, in their representation about the bot users, even with the hedges that they make. But if it's 5%, 10%, 7%, something like that, really come on because it's all judgment and depending on the methodologies used, et cetera. So there's a potential there, the second element being met, if the first one could be met, but still I view that more as a long shot uh, unless some surprising information comes out during the course of the lawsuit because there's nothing that Musk has or cited in his letter that specifically shows that Twitter's representations were so off the base that it would reach this material level. And you'd think if he had that information, he would have put it in his letter to them in terminating the agreements that would get out into the public and um, possibly uh, persuade Twitter not to file this lawsuit or at least to get to the negotiating table before they do that. Musk's final argument in favor of termination or his ability to terminate is that Twitter let go of certain key employees, it didn't uh, work to keep other employees, and it put on this hiring freeze. Um, and those things were outside the course of business that they had promised to conduct inside the agreement. Come on, that's not right. He had tried to have a provision included in the agreement that they couldn't terminate key people, certain key people during the pendency of the agreement. That was not agreed on by Twitter, so they knew that wasn't in the scope. At least that's the thought that was going on into this, or they wouldn't have asked for it in the first place. So a couple of people they let go, uh, did that really change how Twitter works? Does that change the whole business of Twitter? And, uh, come on, no, it has not. Um, secondly, um, freezing the hiring, uh, I think it's, and I don't like Twitter, but it's fair that to say that they should do that as a normal business procedure when the economy uh, was said to be with this high inflation, stock prices were plummeting left and right, what's going on with the money, uh, everything is bad, et cetera. Lots of companies made those kinds of announcements. It's hard to see Twitter as an exception there. In fact, if they had not done that and kept on full steam ahead, you could say they weren't reacting appropriately to the market. And so they had stopped reacting in a normal course of business because they had stopped exercising their judgment and taking the actions that they should take. So I, I don't think this is a winner argument either. So really it comes down to his second argument about this, this whole bot issue. Motive isn't normally a critical element of any legal claim, but it is important to people generally. And so it always comes up in cases. And it does in this one. So Twitter sets out its case that Musk does not have the right to breach the agreement and terminate it in the way that he's saying. And they give out the reasons for that. And then they set out a pretty persuasive story about, well, why would he do this then? He said he wanted to buy it. If we didn't cause him to not buy it, which is what he says, what did cause him to not buy it? And they make the argument that the whole stock market decline, the, the decline of Twitter's price and stock market generally, the decline of Tesla shares that were the basis of Musk wealth and ability to buy Twitter uh, without stretching himself too far, that the, the reduction of those stock prices put a great deal of pressure on Musk and the shine came off of wanting to own Twitter. He had originally said, well, I'd, I'd like to be on the board, I'd like to own it, or I'd like to start my own service. So he never honed in uh, that I just want this one thing, which is my lifelong dream is to own Twitter. But then he did pick that option, move full speed ahead, made a lot of public statements about any kind of forced Twitter into taking this agreement or, or facing a lot of questions from their shareholders. Some people were saying his offer wasn't high enough, but it definitely was a fair offer. They considered it, decided to take it. Stock market plunges. And now Musk is saying, well, I got to get out of here because, primarily because of all these bots, even though he said, one of the reasons he was buying it was he could address this bot issue, improve the user experience, and that potentially, obviously, hopefully for him, would make the entire enterprise more valuable than it was at the time he bought it. That's the whole goal of buying a business is you want to make money from it. Uh, other as aspects of what you want to do with it aside, it needs to do that. And that was his vision for that, that they could find a way to drive revenue by improving user experiences. And one of the primary facets of that was reducing bot encounters. So the bot encounter stayed through before buying it to after it becomes his justification to move away from it. But since it existed before he made his offer, how does that become this new motivation? So I think Twitter's narrative, it's, it's motive for Musk, that he was motivated by the decline in stock prices and the pressure this would put on him financially. It's a pretty good story. Okay, it, it, I buy it. Okay, I think he may be Lance Armstrong in this thing where he has won a lot of big cases 
Some of them, maybe he shouldn't have won, but his track record in litigation is excellent. So he's coming back for one more. Is this a bridge too far when it's in the Delaware Chancery Court, which has a history of enforcing agreements? It's one of the reasons why Delaware is a celebrated uh, state, and this court in particular is celebrated for uh, business uh, contracts and business community is their expertise in it, their ability and willingness to hear these cases rapidly and to enforce agreements between sophisticated parties. So I, I, I think he may be lancing this one a little bit that he's coming back to the well one time too many and he's not going to win this but this can lead to the potential likely outcome that you would see in other situations if this weren't um, clouded to some degree by must celebrity which is the stock market decline twitter's narrative is true this increases the pressure on musk also makes him think man i wish i'd waited a few months i could have got this thing for almost nothing some buyers remorse there even though he may still want the company so the purpose of backing out of the deal now, forcing this into a lawsuit, is to then behind the scenes come to an agreement with Twitter that uh, I've got some good arguments against you on this bot issue. You've got some arguments against me. Why don't we renegotiate this price? Okay, that's what we need to do. We need to bring this price down into the 40s or something like that. And then announce a settlement. Everyone's happy and Musk does end up buying Twitter. That's a potential outcome in this. Um, it really, to me, depends to some degree on what Twitter wants to do. Are they willing to concede enough that Musk will uh, get to a price that he's comfortable with? That's the normal business thing that would happen. But this is also Elon Musk, and sometimes for good and sometimes for bad, he does not always do what, in fact, he rarely does what the normal person will do. So if he says he's backing out of this, he may very well mean in this case, I'm not buying it. Take me all the way through court. I really don't have, ever lose, hardly. So I'm fully confident in it. Not a problem for me. He's done that before. I don't think that's a good idea in this case. But then again, I don't have as much money as he does. So we'll just have to watch the case and see what his response is, because that could change how this is all perceived as well, operating right now just off reading the contract and the lawsuit that Twitter has filed. So we'll watch the case and see what happens. Thanks. Mm -hmm.